We're going to have a very, very interesting hour or so now with Shane Inspector, who's over here now. He is um, a Clare College person, an alum person. He hails from Philadelphia. He's an expert on catastrophe litigation. And um, so whenever there's a catastrophe, you just think Shane in, okay? <laughs> and, um, and he's going to talk about, um, actually he's not going to be talking about that, though I've no doubt that when we get to some question time, if you would like to ask about that, I'm sure he'd be only too pleased to discuss it. But he's going to be <coughs> talking about the judicial process and the appointment of judges to the Supreme Court and the politics associated with that process. Um, he's, uh, he's from Philadelphia, but he's done a lot of law teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, Hastings College at Berkeley, and also at Stanford. And um, I think that we're going to be in for a real treat. There will be uh, time for some questions afterwards. And, um, well, let's hear what you have to say, Shane. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Tony, very much for having me here this evening. And thank you to all of you. This is a wonderfully special place for me. For those of you who are graduates, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And for those of you who have not yet graduated, if you don't know it by now, you will come to learn it. There's nothing in my life that has ever come near my year at Clare College, uh, although those many years ago. I, I learned how to drink sherry and port in the MCR, right upstairs here, uh, to uh, the great disservice of my waistline. But uh, it's just a, such a special place. And I'm very much indebted to, to Tony and to Neil for your many kindnesses to me over the years and for the opportunity to make a contribution to this great college. I'm not talking just a, just a financial contribution, but uh, a contribution that's academic. I've come to teach at Neil's classes uh, many times over the years, and I so treasure my uh, relationships with uh, Clare College students, and whatever opportunity I have to be able to make a contribution to you, uh, I would like to uh, undertake that, whether it's uh, uh, some advice on obtaining a job in the U.S. or achieving professional satisfaction, or how to approach the practice of law, or how to approach a mixed career of teaching and practice, which is where my life is now. I'm delighted to be able to, to give that uh, information to you if, you if you'd like, either later this evening or, or beyond tonight. So Tony asked me to speak on the Supreme Court confirmation process. I wonder if I could ask for a show of hands as to how many of you feel that you followed uh, reasonably closely the uh, Supreme Court confirmation process of now Justice Kavanaugh? Okay, that's, that's uh, uh, probably a little more than half. Uh, how many of you, even if you did not follow it, found the process to have been extraordinarily painful? Yeah, that's quite, quite more than half, quite more than half. So I confess that when I was asked to give this talk tonight, I found the request to be painful. And I found saying yes to be painful. And I will also confess to you that even talking about it to you now, thinking about talking to you now, about it now, I find it to be painful. But my pain in this area goes back 27 years to a nearly identical confirmation process, and that was the process of the confirmation of now Justice Clarence Thomas. How many of you know something about that? Okay, a, a minority of you know something about that. Well, remarkably, it was almost absolutely identical to what just happened with the Kavanaugh hearings. The hearings in the main had closed regarding a sitting judge 
on the DC circuit, a staffer on the Democratic side, not that the party matters because it doesn't, leaked the identity of a female complainant regarding the personal sexual conduct of the nominee. A maelstrom ensued as to what to do. An additional hearing was held, which was watched with captivation by a national television audience. The complainant was highly credible and composed. The nominee was indignant and strident in his response. The panel of senators was largely embarrassed. Essentially, no minds were changed, no votes were changed, and the nominee was narrowly confirmed. All those facts are common to both confirmation <coughs> proceedings. It was extraordinarily painful for me, and the pain still resonates within me, because my father was a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee in 1991 during the Hill Thomas hearings. And he didn't have the benefit of a similar set of hearings 27 years earlier to learn the lessons from. Nothing like that had ever happened in the United States Senate. And I didn't know as I was watching this exactly what I was watching or what it was going to mean within my family, within Pennsylvania, uh, in relation to the electoral process for my father who was to face the voters the next year, what it would mean for America, what the concept of sexual harassment, because that was a sexual harassment case, not a sexual assault case, but there is significant overlap, what that was going to mean for America. None of us knew. We, we were all, or largely, most of us, I should say, not everyone, but we, most of us were horribly uneducated to what we were experiencing and what it would mean for, the, for this country, for, the, for my country. So let me take you backward, if I may, and provide some context for you. Of course, the Senate Judiciary Committee is a committee of the whole of the United States Senate. There were 14 members. And uh, Clarence Thomas was a uh, barely qualified nominee for the Supreme Court. He was chosen significantly because of his race. He was replacing an African-American justice, and there was a strong feeling in the United States that the need to replace Thurgood Marshall with an African-American, that was right beneath the surface of the discussion, uh, but it was there. Uh, Thomas was qualified, but barely. He had served in the Department of Education. He had served on the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. He had served for a brief time as a judge on the uh, D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, which, as many of you know, was a very high court. He'd been there for only a very brief time. <coughs> and he was nominated by President George H.W. Bush to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, in the summer of 1991. And uh, he was given mixed reviews by the various folks that assess nominees. He was given a qualified uh, uh, recommendation by the American Bar Association on a split vote, again, highly unusual. Uh, and as things uh, were developing in the hearings, it looked as if Thomas would be confirmed, but barely. The Republicans had a bare majority in the Senate, and it looked like there would be a largely party line vote. Does this sound familiar to you? Mm -hmm. And uh, when, the, when the hearings came to an end, shortly thereafter, I mean within a couple of days, there, there came this word that there was a woman named Anita Hill 
also a professor who was alleging that Thomas had sexually harassed her. The, the nature of, this, of the sexual harassment was alleged to be uh, suggestive language in the workplace, uh, discussion of uh, Thomas's anatomy and of pornography and of matters of that nature that were uh, unwelcome and that, uh, create, and that created a hostile work environment. And uh, Professor Hill had not authorized the release of her allegations. She had made them quietly to the uh, Senate Democratic Committee staff. She had said she did not want it to, to become public, that she hoped the matter could be resolved without her be becoming uh, a matter of public discussion. Again, does this sound familiar? And uh, of course, the matter could not be resolved, and Thomas would not <laughs> quietly withdraw. And then a member of the Senate Democrat Democratic staff on the Senate Judiciary Committee leaked uh, the name and the allegations of Professor Hill to the news media. Again, does that sound familiar? And uh, with her name made public, uh, it was inevitable <coughs> that she would feel the need to essentially clear her name because now her name was being associated with these allegations, but she was silent. And she determined not to remain silent, and she came to Washington and she appeared at, at a hearing that occurred on the second Saturday in October of 1991. Uh, I, I've never spoken to a group about these hearings. It, it, as I said to you before, it is, it is very painful for me. Um, my father was the most moderate, as in non-conservative, member of the Republican side of the Senate Judiciary Committee. He was the only person who could be thought of among the Republicans as a true swing vote. Four years earlier, he had voted against the nomination of Judge Robert Bork for the U.S. Supreme Court, one of the few Republicans to do so, and his vote against Judge Bork. And his questioning of Judge Bork had sunk the nomination of Judge Bork. So he was viewed as having an unusual degree of credibility among the Republicans. So it was he who was asked by the senior Republicans on the committee to be the person to question Professor Hill. That was a request <laughs> that he felt not only bound to say yes to, but that he was happy to say yes to. He had been a prosecutor. He was a trained investigator. He was a trained questioner. He was a trained trial attorney. He had been in the Senate for 11 years. He had questioned many witnesses. And he certainly felt himself to be well equipped to question Professor Hill. And that's what he did. And I watched the hearings on television. And my impression was, here is a skilled attorney asking questions in a non-judgmental way and getting answers from a, a very skilled witness. And I, that's not meant in any way to be derogatory of Professor Hill. When I say skilled, I mean intelligent, well-educated, Yale Law School, a professor of law, someone who knew how to answer a question, someone who uh, was reasonably comfortable under these extremely uh, stressful circumstances, as was Professor Blasey Ford, 27 years later. Uh, and what I failed to appreciate, and what my father failed to appreciate when he was questioning Professor Hill, is that his questions were seen by a large percentage of Americans, mostly women, but not all women, some men as well, as being unfair and that to question a victim or alleged victim of sexual harassment uh, was itself improper. And many Americans, again, mostly women but not all, felt that when he was questioning her, that they were being questioned because they had been victimized by incidents of sexual harassment. And I think that my father, in retrospect, felt that he was tone deaf to that circumstance. 
and that, and that his questionings, especially magnified on television, would, would, would not be seen for what he felt they were, which was an effort to get at the truth of what had occurred. There were questions by other members of the Senate. Justice, uh, then Judge, now Justice Thomas, testified after Professor Hill. He was very angry. Again, does that sound familiar? And the hearings closed with uh, controversy about why it was that other witnesses were not called. Again, that sounds familiar. And the hearings concluded. When, when the hearings concluded, there was public opinion polling nationally at the performance of the senators. And 60% uh, of the American public approved of my father's questioning of Professor Hill, and about 20% disapproved of it. And I thought that seemed to be about right. And then I saw, and we all saw, this remarkable transformation of public opinion uh, led by uh, our national news media, who was almost uniformly aghast, number one, at the nomination of Judge Thomas, and number two, at his confirmation, and who felt very much <coughs> akin to Professor Hill and her allegations. And the, the uh, public opinion polling eventually turned against members of the Senate including my father, uh, such that his approval in terms of his handling of the Hill-Thomas hearings went from about 60-20 uh, to uh, about 35-45. In Pennsylvania, where he was a member of the United States Senate, he lost 5% of his favorable rating, which had been at about 60%, down to about 55% in the weeks after the hearings, again, as a product of this sort of developing public maelstrom over the hearings. I was very involved in all of his campaigns for public office. Uh, I was characterized as his closest advisor. And, you know, I was very concerned about the effect of this on his reelection. And I saw in communities that were his closest supporters, the sort of moderate and even liberal communities in Philadelphia suburbs, as an example, uh, just absolute horror at his perceived conduct <coughs> in relation to these hearings. And I saw him uh, uh, really be shocked at how others reacted to the hearings and how he comported himself. He uh, said thereafter that he did not appreciate the, the feelings of the American public about sexual harassment before the hearings and that the hearings had been a learning experience for him, which of course they were. He was asked many times if he would apologize for his questioning of Professor Hill. And he said that he would not, that he felt he had nothing to apologize for. And he invited, uh, many times I heard him say to people who would be very vocal about his questioning, he would say to them, I invite you to come to my office, bring the tapes of the hearings, show me where I asked an inappropriate question or a question in an inappropriate way. Uh, but that was an insufficient defense for him to articulate to the great mass of Pennsylvanians who were unhappy with him. That's not to say that there were Pennsylvanians who were not happy with him, because there were quite a few who were. They tended to be people who were in favor of Judge Thomas to begin with. And the people who were unhappy with the performance were people who tended to be against Judge Thomas to begin with. This was very much outcome determinative. Your approval of the senators in the confirmation hearings turned around whether you thought Thomas should be confirmed or not. As it worked out in the campaign, he held a series of open house town meetings across Pennsylvania, particularly in neighborhoods where the, the kinds of voters that I've described uh, were, were concentrated. Uh, the hearings caused, caused a new candidate to run against him, uh, a, a woman who, uh, whose campaign was articulated as 
a response to the Hill Thomas hearings. And the reelection campaign was a very, very close election, much, much closer than it would have been otherwise. He was reelected, uh, but, but it was certainly a uh, searing experience, searing, searing for him, uh, searing for me, particularly given his background as a moderate, as uh, someone who had been very aligned with women's causes and, uh, and, and, and women's interests. So then we fast forward to the Blasey Ford Kavanaugh hearings. And I don't need to spend as much time on that, I think, with you as I have on the Hill Thomas hearings, because most of you know what happened there. Um, the hearings had closed as the Kavanaugh. This allegation had been, had been extant since August of this year. Uh, it had not been shared with uh, um, Senator Grassley, who was the chairman of the committee. Senator Feinstein was aware of it because she had been told about it by a member of the House. Um, the identity of, of, of Professor Blasey Ford was leaked by a Senate Democratic staffer. Uh, it is uh, a fact of life in America, like in Britain, that the news media doesn't investigate itself. So who was the leaker is something that we'll doubtlessly never know. Uh, uh, the media can't survive, frankly, without people who leak information. And those of us who are interested in a robust debate, I think, have to accept the reality of leaks as a part of the process. And I'm not condemning that in any manner. But that is what happened. There was a leak of her name, and she then felt put upon, just as, just as uh, Professor Hill felt put upon. And you may recall the circumstance where she wasn't sure she would come, and she was concerned about her security, and would they come to California and interview her there? And then she finally decided that she would come, and she came. And then, of course, she was compelling. She was she was compelling. And and I'm not and I'm not undertaking a value judgment on whether she was right or wrong. And I, and I haven't said that either as Pro Professor Hill or, or Judge Thomas. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to talk about, about my personal view in that regard. But she was compelling. And for those of you who don't remember or didn't see, Judge Kavanaugh was extraordinarily strident in his reply, much more so than was Judge Thomas. Uh, many people in the United States felt that Judge Kavanaugh was well qualified to be elevated to the U.S. Supreme Court by virtue of his background, of his education, of his training, and of his experience. He, he had served in the White House. He had been a longtime member of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, yes, he was a conservative, but that's the reality of elections. If the conservative is elected president, they're going to nominate conservative nominees for the court. And if a liberal is elected president, they'll have liberal nominees. And that, you know, to, to, to the victor goes the spoils uh, within limits, so long as they're qualified. That's why we have an advice and consent function in our Constitution. The Senate has to uh, confirm. If they choose not to confirm, the president sends over a new nominee. But the president's selection is given significant deference. So uh, uh, Judge Kavanaugh as I mentioned, was indeed very strident. And there were many Americans who felt that while Judge Kavanaugh was qualified to be elevated to the U.S. Supreme Court, and, other, and, and, and some who also felt that, uh, that um, uh, they could not make a determination of disqualification based solely upon Professor Blasey Ford's testimony. There are many Americans who felt that Judge Kavanaugh's demeanor was so far outside the mainstream as to disqualify him for confirmation. I confess that I've never seen anyone act that way in a congressional hearing. I've never seen anyone act that way on television, at least not in what purports to be nonfiction. But what happened? What happened? Uh, Judge Kavanaugh was confirmed. 
Uh, the reality is, is that virtually no minds were changed. No minds were changed in the United States Senate, and virtually no minds were changed in the public. And I would, for those of you who care about this issue, it doesn't turn out many of you do, I would, I would respectfully ask you to look into your own mind and your own heart when you're considering this issue and ask yourself whether you had any different view about Judge Kavanaugh's qualification for the U.S. Supreme Court after the hearings as before the hearings. And what I really mean by that is, if you were going to vote no on Judge Kavanaugh before the Blasey Ford Kavanaugh hearings, was your mind changed to yes? And if you would have voted yes, was your mind changed to no? I mean, I think there are many, many people who were very unhappy with his performance, but they almost exclusively tend to be people who were already against his nomination. And he, he, he ended up being confirmed, in the, of course, as you know, in nearly the closest of votes. So, so where, where, where is America on this? What, what are, what's the lesson to be learned from this? Uh, I would love to tell you that there's something, there's something uh, curative that, that I could point to, that we could say, uh, we could derive meaning here. I think the, the truth of the matter is that when we deal with an issue of sexual assault or sexual harassment, these are the most sensitive of issues that exist in our society. I teach evidence uh, at American law schools. I have a class on the rules of evidence as apply in uh, sexual abuse cases. Every year when I teach that class, I prepare with extra care and extra concern about the classroom discussion. Every year I give a five minute talk before we begin the class where I talk about the necessity for us to be sensitive to each other, that many of us ourselves have been victims of sexual harassment or sexual assault, and if not victims ourselves, someone close to us has been, and, and that we feel especially sensitively about these issues. And there are others who have other views on these matters whose views must be respected within the classroom setting. That's an abbreviation of the talk. And by the way, I give it from a typewritten statement that I've composed, and I don't want to get a single word wrong, because that's how concerned I am about this subject in my classroom with my students. And that's the reality of this subject in American life. And it can't be any different uh, in, in the United Kingdom. The people are people, and these issues are, are the most intense, as well they should be. So I don't know how much progress we can hope to make through hearings like this. I know in America, the Hill Thomas hearings were an eye opener for a lot of Americans, including my father, who had an inadequate appreciation of how many Americans felt victimized by uh, sexual harassment. Uh, but that was only a first step, and it, didn't, it did not prevent the uh, horrific nature of the hearings that, that we saw uh, this fall. I think a second matter that I would comment on, in terms of trying to find some place for improvement, is a greater degree of responsibility from the Senate. And, and I would particularly point to Senator Feinstein, who has otherwise been a distinguished member of the United States Senate for a very long time. But she got this letter from <coughs> Professor Blasey Ford, which had been sent originally to Professor Blasey Ford's member of Congress. And it was shared with permission with Senator Feinstein. Senator Feinstein had an obligation to take that letter, and if she felt the need to redact the name of the sender, she could do that, to uh, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Senator Grassley, and say to, say to him, as she was the ranking member, she was the most senior Democrat on the committee, she had an obligation to take that letter to him, either redacted or unredacted, and if, and if unredacted with permission of Professor Blasey Ford, and to say to him, 
Senator Grassley, we have a problem. We have a, we have a complaint against uh, Judge Kavanaugh. It has specificity. It's very serious in nature. And let's talk together about what we're going to do about this. And then it would have been up to Senator Grassley to reach out for Professor Blasey Ford and in a bipartisan way to ask her to come in and give testimony and to do so in a way that would be comfortable for her, but, but hopefully would be public because of the uh, extreme public interest in the issue. And it does not cover her with glory that she did not do that. Uh, she should have done that. Uh, no members of the Senate were covered with glory in 2018 in these hearings. No members of the Senate were covered with glory in 1991. My father's experience as a questioner of Professor Hill directly <coughs> led to the Senate's abdication of their role as questioner of Professor Blasey Ford. You saw they brought in uh, a prosecutor from Tucson, Arizona, to engage in questioning of Professor Blasey for <coughs> why? Because none of them wanted to, to uh, have the stain on their careers that my father had on his career from questioning Professor Hill. They all knew what my father went through in the aftermath of those hearings. And none of them wanted that for themselves. So uh, uh, the prosecutor was brought into question. Uh, for those of us who are interested in, in a trial technique or questioning technique or investigative undertakings, it's obvious that you cannot develop a line of questioning in five-minute intervals, which is what occurred here. She was given five minutes, and then a Democratic senator was given five minutes. Most of the Democratic senators opted to bloviate instead of ask questions. Uh, when they were finished with their five minutes of, uh, of, of their time, the matter went back to the prosecutor from Tucson, five minutes more, about the Democratic side. It was a, a thoroughly unuseful, unuseful process in terms of actually getting at the truth. It was not a search for truth. It was, it was a political exercise. If I were to be slightly complimentary to the process of 1991, at least there was questioning and an effort by the senators to develop the facts. And as it worked out, it was tone deaf to the, to the feelings of uh, of, of many in the public about, about these matters. And that's, as I say, what caused there to be essentially this abdication of central responsibility in 2018. So I think if we were to take another lesson from this, and that is there needs to be a prompt investigation in a bipartisan way, which there was not, that could have been avoided. Number two, there should be real questioning developed by the senators with real time and if the senators are not going to ask the questions, and by the way, they don't have to, then bring in lawyers on both sides to ask the questions, but give them an hour apiece, an hour here, and then an hour there, and then come back for an hour more, and take as much time as you need within reason to get everything out on the table. If you're going to have a hearing, you need to have, excuse me, a hearing. And there was not a hearing. So that would be a second takeaway. It's not that I'm optimistic about that occurring, because what occurred was so bad, it could have been so much better given the lessons of 1991, but that would be a second potential takeaway. And the third takeaway, if I may, is I think we have to undertake a stark recognition uh, as, uh, as adults that The Senate is not a place that is amenable to a frank discussion of topics that are as serious as an accusation of sexual harassment or sexual assault. The senators, regrettably, are motivated by political considerations, by party affiliation, by re-election, and that doubtlessly colors, if not overwhelms, their judgment on these issues. It's such a regrettable thing for me to say, particularly as an American speaking to uh, a British audience, but that's the reality of things. And I, I wish it weren't so, but the reality is that, that the exercise was an exercise in power. Uh, the Republicans controlled the Senate, and I, this is not meant as a statement of party, because if the Democrats had controlled the Senate, I think there were the opposite 
would have occurred. They, their, their nominee would have been confirmed. The fact that so few minds were changed in either confirmation procedure, proceeding, either in the public or among the Senate, I think tells us that, that these matters are largely outcome driven in the minds of many of us. And I, I, and I hope that we can try to separate our feelings about these kinds of accusations, and they are very serious, from the feelings that we have about who should sit on the Supreme Court. It's very difficult, I think, for many of us, I include myself in that category, to do that. But, but I do believe that we need to be rigorous in how we approach these issues. Kavanaugh could have been qualified on paper and by training and by experience, but have been disqualified by virtue of committing a sexual assault. There aren't many people who feel that way. You know, there just aren't. There are most people who felt he was qualified that either did not believe Professor Blasey Ford weren't convinced or didn't think it was enough to keep him off the court. Uh, on, on the other hand, Professor Blasey Ford could be disbelieved, but a person could believe that Judge Kavanaugh was not qualified to sit on the court by virtue of background training and experience. Not a lot of people felt fell in that category either. And I think that there's an object lesson in that for us about our willingness to rigorously separate those issues. So with that, I know I'm the only person sitting between you and the bar, so I'd be happy to take a few questions and then we'll have a glass of sherry.